What's up guys? Welcome back to Bird Dog Gaming. What if I asked you to come up with a list of game series that jumped from 2D in one game to 3D gameplay in the next game? How many do you think you could come up with? Probably a whole lot. Think about it, some of the biggest names in the industry had to make the switch in the late 90s. You got Mario, Sonic, Zelda, Rayman, Metroid, Final Fantasy, Grand Theft Auto, even freaking Bubsy. But lately, society's kind of been taking a step backwards. And I don't necessarily mean it in a bad way. Take a look at Shovel Knight, for example. Shovel Knight is a fantastic 2D platformer based on the 8-bit era of gaming. Look at Celeste, Sonic Mania, Donkey Kong Country, both Returns and Tropical Freeze, Hollow Knight, Dead Cells. These are some of the best games to come out in the past 10 years, and they're all two-dimensional. And that leads us into the topic of today's video. I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at 10 game series that started out with 3D titles, and somewhere down the line, they started making 2D titles. That means games like Mario and Sonic that started out as 2D games and then jumped into the 3D realm and then went back to 2D are not going to be included in this conversation. Oh, and one last thing, these games are not in any particular order, so don't try to come fight me in the comments below. Everyone knows Tomb Raider for being that action-packed, adventurous game series that had an awesome start in the 90s, then a dozen garbage titles in the 2000s, and finally a really awesome trilogy of Uncharted clones in the 2010s. But no one ever mentions the fact that this series also had its fair share of 2D games. Yeah, starting in 2000, Core Design developed the series' first two-dimensional Tomb Raider for the Game Boy Color, simply titled Tomb Raider. Yeah, name it Tomb Raider, the same name as the first game, I'm sure no one will be confused. It's a pretty straightforward platformer. You get to use Lara's pistol and light up every scorpion that gets in your way. There's 14 levels and a whole lot of different moves. The next handheld title came out in 2001, also for the Game Boy Color, titled Curse of the Sword. This one was a 2D platformer as well. Both of these are $10 cartridges if you're looking to try them out on your own. They actually had pretty great reviews from IGN, but if you're a collector looking to have them complete in box, it's going to cost you. Curse of the Sword is a pretty uncommon box with the only one on eBay listed at a starting price of $150. Next up is Chibi Robo, a series that had its debut back in 2005 on the GameCube. It's known for being a 3D platforming series centered around an adorable 10 centimeter tall robot named, you guessed it, Chibi Robo. You control this little dude as he cleans up the house and does other random chores, but in 2015, Chibi Robo went 2D in his second 3DS installment titled Chibi Robo Zip Lash. This title reminds me a lot of Yoshi's Wooly World and Crafted World, except without any of the fun. He even got his own amiibo. The game didn't get the best reviews and neither did Photo Finder, which is also on 3DS, so I don't know if or when we will see Chibi Robo in the future. If you're looking to pick this one up with the amiibo or without, you won't spend more than 10 or 15 bucks. Remember 2009 when Rocksteady just decided that they were going to put out one of the best superhero games of all time? Batman Arkham Asylum showed everyone what superhero games had the potential to be. It literally holds the Guinness World Record for most critically acclaimed superhero game of all time. Since then, the Arkham series has seen three mainline sequels, a few spin-offs, a VR game, Arkham's even made it to mobile. Today we're going to talk about one of those spin-offs one that made its way to both PS Vita and 3DS, Batman Arkham Origins Blackgate. Blackgate was a 2.5D beat-em-up with some Metroidvania thrown in. It was developed by Armature Studio and released in 2013 to some pretty mediocre reviews. In the game, Captain Gordon contacts Batman to let him know there was a recent explosion at Blackgate Prison. When Batman gets there, he finds out the prison's been divided up into three sections, one led by the Joker, one by the Penguin, and another by Black Mask. The player is able to fight through the sections in whichever order they please. Believe it or not, the 3DS version actually did better on Metacritic than the Vita version. Blackgate also got a deluxe re-release in North America and Europe for consoles. 
I'm sure that's the better way to play, but I don't think it ever got a physical release. The 3DS version is about 10 bucks, and the Vita one is going to run you 15 or 20 This one's been on my backlog for a while. It looks like a solid game that I'd probably enjoy. Speaking of superhero games, I still think we need a rated M open world Punisher game. I mean, come on, how does that not exist already? Oh, right. When you get a bunch of ex-rare employees in a room together, what do you get? Obviously, a spiritual successor to Banjo-Kazooie, one of the most beloved Nintendo 64 games. Ukulele was born in 2017 out of Platonic Games. The game makes an unbelievable amount of references to Banjo and the 64-bit era in general, and features a beautiful soundtrack that is exactly like what Rare put out in the 90s. Reviews were around a 6 or a 7 out of 10, but when the second game, Ukulele and the Impossible Lair dropped last year, the developers went a totally different route, making it a 2D platformer. An absolutely beautiful 2D platformer at that. I mean, it's far from unique in the sense that it is really similar to the latest Donkey Kong Country games, but they did a great job copying them. I'd personally place this game just below Tropical Freeze, I mean it is that good. There are a couple of things that do set it apart from DK, one is the overworld. Instead of just moving to the next level, you have to work through different puzzles and uncover secrets to unlock your next level. Another thing, the final level is actually unlocked from the get-go, but it's insanely difficult to pass without going through the other 40 levels first. Each level you complete unlocks a worker bee that acts as a shield for you against the endless perils of the impossible lair. Kind of reminds me of how you can face Calamity Ganon pretty early in Breath of the Wild, but it's not going to be easy until after you've upgraded Link immensely. Apparently this is more of a spin-off title than a mainline entry, but personally I think they should continue making 2D platformers. If you're looking to pick this one up, I don't want to throw out a price for such a modern game, but keep an eye on sales at major retailers. I remember Assassin's Creed being one of those games that just blew everyone away in 2007. I can't believe it's been almost 13 years. In those 13 years, Ubisoft has had a bunch of ups and downs with the series, publishing games on literally every platform. Yes, even Google Stadia. There are so many games in the series. I counted 34 plus or minus, which averages to 2-3 to three games per year. How could any fan even keep up? With 30 plus games in the series, it only makes sense that at least one of them is two-dimensional. Today we're shining the spotlight on 2009's Assassin's Creed II Discovery for the Nintendo DS. Developed by Gryptonite Games, this title featured most of the jumping, rolling, swinging, and climbing of a typical Assassin's Creed, just in a 2D setting. The stealth was still there too. You had the option to either fight or avoid the enemies. You had the option of handling each memory in three different ways. Normal, where you could take your time with the level and explore the environment at your own pace. Chase, which had you reach the objective rather quickly, avoiding enemies and being shot at by arrows. And Stealth, which required you to avoid confrontation at all with enemies. The game got 7s and 8s for the most part, and honestly it looks like it's aged pretty well. You can pick this game up for less than 10 bucks. Watch some gameplay, it might be a decent game to check out in 2020. I'm sure it paved the way for the Assassin's Creed Chronicles series of games that were also 2D. From the creative mind of Shigeru Miyamoto himself, Pikmin was born in 2001 on the GameCube. Pikmin is a calm, peaceful game where you take control of little alien lifeforms and force them to do your work for you. The first sequel was released in 2004, and Pikmin 3 didn't come out for another 9 years after that on the Wii U. Speaking of which, it's one of only about 25 video games that are still exclusive to the platform, I've got a whole video on that. While Pikmin has always been known for its 3D adventure style, 2017's Hey Pikmin changed things up, being the first 2D title of the series. Released exclusively for the 3DS, the goal of the game remained largely the same, collect all of the items required for each mission by the time you reach the ship at the end of the level. Developed by Arzest, Hey Pikmin got a pretty weak score of 6 out of 10 from both GameSpot and Nintendo Life. 
but if you want to try the game for yourself, it's only going to cost you 10 or 15 bucks. Full Metal Alchemist is one of those must-see animes, and every must-see anime has to have some video games based on it, right? In Japan in 2003, Rakjin developed the first FMA game titled Full Metal Alchemist and the Broken Angel exclusively for the PS2. It was an action RPG that lets you take on the roles of both Elric boys and featured an original story written by Hiromu Arakawa, who wrote the manga. The two sequels were also PS2 exclusives, but the third one never made its way to North America. Now I've got a few contenders here for which was the first 2D game in the series, I'll let you guys argue about it amongst yourselves, it just kinda depends on your definition of what a 2D game is. Stray Rondo and Sonata of Memories were two RPGs for the Game Boy Advance that both released in 2004. Then there was Dream Carnival, a 2D fighting game released exclusively on the PS2, also in 2004. And while these three titles released only in Japan, another 2D game titled Dual Sympathy was a side-scrolling beat-em-up for the Nintendo DS. Get it? DS? Dual Sympathy? When I was researching for this video, I thought a beat-em-up based on one of my favorite animes sounded awesome, and I definitely want to check this one out despite its mediocre review scores. This one will cost you $15 to $20 complete in box, and if you want to try the other three, you'll have to import or maybe try a ROM. Tom Clancy games have been around for longer than you probably think. I always thought the series started back in the late 90s with Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell, but there were actually quite a few tactical submarine simulators dating all the way back to 1987 that were based on Tom Clancy books. They released on various platforms over the years like the ZX Spectrum, the Commodore 64, Amiga, Atari ST, NES, Game Boy, and Super Nintendo. But for this video, we're going to focus on the Rainbow Six franchise, which started in 1998 on the PS1, Dreamcast, and Nintendo 64. The game was a tactical shooter like the majority of Tom Clancy games we've come to know, and is still making sequels to this day. But in 2002, Rainbow Six Rogue Spear made its way onto the Game Boy Advance, where it became a top-down tactical shooter where you control several soldiers through stealth missions. Aside from this game, there was only one other handheld Rainbow Six game that could be considered 2D and I'm not even sure that I would. Simply titled Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six, it released in 2000 for the Game Boy Color and was one of those move the cursor and shoot the enemies on screen games which I imagine is really boring on a d-pad. But back to Rogue Spear, if you're interested in trying 2D Tom Clancy, there isn't a ton of gameplay on YouTube for this one but it got pretty solid reviews when it launched and it's only a $20 cartridge. This is another one where the box might be tough to come by, I only see one listing for a complete copy. Alright, raise your hand if you've ever broken off a friendship after a game of Mario Party. In 1996, Nintendo brought together the Mario Gang and Donkey Kong to play what is essentially a board game with mini games in between each round. After releasing six home console installments, Nintendo decided they had destroyed enough friendships and released a portable two-dimensional Mario Party for their widely successful Game Boy Advance. And while it was technically four-player via the Game Boy Advance link cable, who actually played this game with their friends? The options were pretty limited with multiplayer mode. Out of like a hundred minigames, you could play 12 with friends. Kristen Reed of Eurogamer stated that Mario Party Advance was, quote, practically the dictionary definition of awful. Big yikes. This cartridge is going to run you $15 max if Kristen's review didn't discourage you from picking it up. Alright, on to our last title today. 1997 brought the world of Turok to the Nintendo 64 and later, PC. Now, I always knew Turok as an FPS where you explore a prehistoric world and go kill dinosaurs, but I had no idea Turok Battle of the Bionosaurs existed. Developed by bit managers, the first 2D Turok was released less than a year after the console game as a sort of partner to the Nintendo 64 version. It's a pretty basic 2D action platformer where you go through levels shooting everything that gets in your way. Then there was Turok 2 on the Game Boy Color which looked to be pretty similar gameplay wise. But before Turok 3, 
Turok Rage Wars came out on the Game Boy Color that really changed the game for 2D Turoks. Instead of platforming, the game was more of a beat em up focusing on combat. You had the ability to switch between your knife and various guns. Turok 3 came out and seemed to only improve upon this with the ability to drive several vehicles and ride dinosaurs. Heck, there was even a shmup stage where you sit on the back of a pterodactyl. The game was faster and more colorful and the soundtrack was killer, but in 2002, Turok Evolution, the final 2D Turok title, was released and it felt nothing like a Turok game. Whereas previous titles were developed by bit managers, this game was handled by RFX Interactive, a company who had really only made cartoony children's games prior to this. Turok Evolution on the Game Boy Advance was a complete running gun with all of the thrill and difficulty that you would expect. It's so explosive and violent like the devs had just been itching to create something more mature than Inspector Gadget in Toonsylvania. You had a freaking weapon wheel of guns on the Game Boy Advance. This game looked and felt like Metal Slug more than it did any previous entry in the Turok series. Today, a copy of this game is going to run you a measly $10 and I'd say it's well worth it. And there you have it, 10 game series that made the switch from 3D into 2D. What was your favorite game from the list? What was your least favorite game from the list? It was actually pretty difficult to find 10 games to make this list. Can you think of any more that fit this criteria? Drop a comment. Who knows, maybe there will be a part 2 to this video. But it's time to wrap this one up, so come and chat with me in the comments or on my various social medias, whatever, and subscribe to the channel and we'll see you guys next time on Bird Dog Gaming.